Welcome back, everybody. It's great to see you all back here. I see we have a, a packed house for uh, one of the most anticipated speakers at this conference. We have Vivienne Redding with us today, whom all of you know, I, I'm sure. Uh, she is the uh, European Commissioner for Justice, Fundamental Rights, and Citizenship. And we're very excited to have her here with us today because she has been uh, championing, championing, she is a champion, obviously, uh, in the general area of citizens' rights, but in particular, she has been champion, championing um, an issue uh, that has both sparked debate and introspection, um, and that is strengthening the EU's commitment to equality between men and women in adopting a women's charter. As part of that, she has presented measures to improve the representation of women in boardrooms, uh, including, uh, you know, uh, considering a proposal for introducing a 40% rule that could open the way for women to be more represented in supervisory boards or in non-executive uh, board members of publicly listed companies in Europe. So far, this proposal has met with mixed results, and it's also generated a vocal debate across Europe with various groups of stakeholders in favor and against. Um, myself, I'm Liz Alderman. I'm uh, the uh, chief business correspondent for the International Herald Tribune and the New York Times here in Europe. And this is a subject of great interest to me uh, personally um, as a journalist. And so I'm very excited to have uh, Vivienne here to talk to us, you know, about sort of why are we doing this, you know, who is helping, and what are really the economics behind this? Why is this an economic imperative for us at this point in time? To speak about the economics first, uh, of course, it is a question of gender equality, that it always is. But second, women mean business. And there have been so many studies, not made by feministic groups, but by uh, Ernest and Young and uh, Deutsche Bank and uh, uh, McKinsey, um, who came to the conclusion that companies who have women on board have a net advantage uh, in the results they are doing, their economic and financial results. So really women mean business and are good for the business world. And then we do have another problem in Europe, you know, we are an aging society and we run out of young talent for the future and 60% of our university graduates are females and we do not have the right to leave that talent idle and not to bring that talent into our companies and in the to on the top of our companies because this young female talent also needs role models women to look at and to see, yes, if they can do it, we can do it. So it goes bottom up and top down. I mean, those are obviously very convincing arguments, um, but at the same time, there's a question as to sort of why haven't more large European companies signed on to a pledge like this yet? Well, uh, I think it is the old boys network which doesn't want to be disturbed by women coming in because all the economic uh, arguments are on the table, they are crystal clear. I tried during two years to do it by self-regulation and the CEOs came, told me, we can do it by ourselves. So I said, okay, do it. Two years later, what did we see? In two years time, there was a two percentage point increase. That means we need 40 more years in order to arrive to a certain equilibrium. We saw that this two percentage point increase did not come from all member states, but it came mainly because of France. France had an increase from 12 to 22 percent in the last two years because France is working and has decided on quotas, on legal quotas. So that brings me to the conclusion, I don't like quarters, but I like what quarters do. And probably it's the only way out to have quarters so that we do not need to wait 40 years. We cannot afford to wait 40 years. In crisis time, women mean business and you need the talent. Well, I mean, even, even against the backdrop of the crisis that, that we are living right now here in Europe, also slow growth in the United States, 
some somewhat slower growth that's happening in some of the emerging markets. H how do you respond to uh, some of the counterpoints that have been put out there um, to the argument that you just made? Yesterday in Britain, uh, the Equalities uh, Minister, Helen Grant, warned that uh, women risk being potentially demeaned by EU quotas that would force companies to appoint more women, and Britain would now be joining a group of about eight other EU nations to try to halt that drive. How do you, why is that, do you think, response happening, and, and how do you respond to it? Well, the first thing is Britain is not joining a group. Britain has organized a group. Um, Britain was at, um, at the basis of uh, the uh, no-sayers. Um, on basis of what? On basis of an ideological position because there is no text on the table on which you could discuss. The text has not yet been uh, decided. And um, then I would answer to this minister if she had asked me um, that uh, exactly uh, she would be right if the text would draw that you just take a woman in because she is a woman. No, the text makes it very clear that by equal capacities and equal value of the candidate, the underrepresented sex has to be taken in. So we are speaking about highly qualified women. And then, look, I always got the, uh, the question by the uh, CEOs who told me, yes, but we would like to do it. But do you know women who can come to the boards, women who are capable to do that? Now, I gave that question to the top level business schools in Europe. And they did their job. They publicized an, uh, uh, 8,000 names, 8,000 of women who have the highest possible studies and year-long experience in management. So 8,000 board, able, board ready women are there. There is no more excuse not to take them on board. Mm. So what's the... So, there, so therefore, for the countries that are pushing back, what's the problem? I think it is an ideological problem. They do not want to have quotas. Mm -hmm. They say they can do it by themselves. Well, I really see that some countries in the north of uh, Europe are managing to do it by themselves. But sorry to say, the others don't. There has been even a regress in many countries in the last year. And uh, the average is 14% uh, of women on the boards, which means a de facto quota of 86% for men. <laughs> that's, another, that's another way of looking at it. For the countries that have been doing it right, what is their secret to success? Some countries who have managed to do it without quotas, those are the countries where having a, a job and a family is a normal thing and where the um, corporate life is organized in such a way that parents, fathers and mothers, can cope with the family. Uh, the other countries where things are working well are those who have established uh, legal quotas, and all the other countries are around 3-4%, very, very low, and no pro uh, progress at all. Mm -hmm. One other question that has been raised about this initiative is, 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 is there perhaps uh, an excess balance of focus on uh, trying to get women into non-executive board positions? Shouldn't the aim be higher? Yes, but one has to start with one thing. And uh, our European law is rather clear uh, that uh, we must not intervene into the management of a company. Uh, so uh, we have decided to go for non-executive uh, positions and to start with their... You, you see, quotas are not a goal. Uh, quotas are an instrument in order to break the glass ceiling. Once the glass ceiling is broken, you don't need quotas anymore. Uh, that is why I would rather utilize those as a tool. Open it, open it. And then the female talent can flourish. We might come one day to the, um, to the situation where um, if you look for a board member, you just look for the best talent and you don't care if this talent is female or male. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I just wonder, maybe, do you have an insight on in the countries where this has been successful? What has been the difference? Have, have, has anybody told you sort of anecdotes about companies where we do have 40 percent women on boards? How, how has that changed the dynamic or the management of such a company? Well, it was less cozy in the beginning when women came to the boards because they started to ask questions. And um, most boards uh, did not have this, uh, uh, this tradition of question asking and needing to give an answer. But that do, does good to the boards because that prevents to make errors. If you are asked questions and you have to give answer, you, you lose less money, you do less errors. Um, so it really changes the situation inside the boards, but there are many companies who go for it. And um, there are also companies who have promised it and have done it. I give you uh, two examples uh, from Germany, because Germany is a very reluctant country. Well, the Deutsche Bank had made a study about uh, women in top leadership positions in the corporate world and came to the conclusion that it is positive for the corporate world to have more women on board and it followed this by action. So they do have now 42% in uh, their supervisory uh, board. Another company in, Ger in Germany who has started last year is Bertelsmann and they are also advancing very quickly and they see that the result also towards their customers is very per uh, positive because you see 70% of all purchase decisions are taken by women. So to have a woman on board who has this relation with the ones who are going to purchase objects or services is very valuable indeed. Mm -hmm. So at this stage, I mean, what, what kind of support are you receiving, for whom, and how do you ultimately think this initiative will, will play out? Is it going to become an EU-wide rule? Are, are some adjustments going to have to be made? What's the light at the end of the tunnel here? Well, I am in politics now since 1979. I have never seen a fight like that. Huh? I have done a lot of fights, a lot of important ones, but one like this I have never seen because it is simply not played on objective grounds. But there are many who help. I have told you the business schools. They came in by themselves in order to help. There are very many uh, women organizations and networks sitting in this room who are helping. The European Parliament has already asked three times in a resolution to go ahead. So um, I have very many co-fighters. And yesterday evening there was the French Minister of Equal Opportunities uh, with us in this conference. Well, she has signed a very important letter together with the Minister of Economy of France in order to say we go for it and they are organizing a group of countries who want to go for it. So I am not feeling alone at all. I think there is a drive. It's going to be a terrible fight, but I want to win the war. So I don't care about this battle or that battle. In the end, we need the women talent on board and we need the women models so that young women can take the courage and say, well, if she made it, I will make it too. I have the political possibility to help and I put that on the table in order to be the driver. Spoken like a, a true general. So let's give our support for Vivian Redding. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to speak about this subject near and dear to the hearts of a lot of people here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you.